Hi, welcome to Functional Justin episode 16. So it's been a while since I made a video. Um, I've been trying to think what to cover next and I've come up with a series of videos that's going to begin with uh, the idea of non-empty collections and specifically non-empty lists. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, non-empty lists, non-empty collections in general in terms of what they're useful for and um, uh, how you implement them. And um, also going to introduce you to a new uh, programming library I've been working on. So let's start with that. So introducing Duct. So uh, what is Duct? So Duct is a new project that I started on my GitHub. And uh, as you can see, it has a nice logo. Um, had a had a guy on Fiverr make this, and he made this based on my vague description of what I wanted, and I'm pretty happy with it. So uh, what is Duct? It stands for Dotty Utilizing Category Theory Library. So that's a mouthful. Uh, what it means is Dotty uh, is the name of the Scala 3 compiler, which comes from the dot calculus, which was a formal proof that Odersky and his team made of um, the Scala 3 type system. So that's the Dotty part. And then utilizing category theory, um, essentially what I'm doing is taking the category theory style constructs that you'll see in Haskell, uh, you see them in Scala Z, you see them in CATS, and uh, implement them all together in this uh, collection, in this repository, so that you can uh, find all the code from the videos in one place. And then as I write new code, I can put the code in there, I can add tests, I can add documentation, and it just provides a much nicer continuity for the series of videos. So the goals of the library is it's going to be simple as possible code. Um, code and tests written for humans, not compilers. So in other words, wherever there is a choice between making something uh, complex or simple, I choose simple. And all the development is documented on this uh, YouTube channel and in my blog. So you'll find links in the code to particular things. Uh, and it's Scala 3 first, so I don't have to worry about backwards compatibility. Uh, there's some non-goals of the project, so I'm not worried about things like stack safety, performance, uh, adoption, for so you can use it in production. Uh, maybe later I will work on an effect type, so you know you have your Zios, you have your cat's effects, you have your monix tasks. Um, no plans to do that, but it may I may do it in the future. It certainly won't be a production-ready effect type. It will just be done to demonstrate the. Uh, the way that effects work and the way that they're encoded in Scala. So that's a quick introduction to Duct. The next thing I'd like to talk about is making impossible states impossible. So the idea, uh, or the wording there, comes from Richard Feldman, who is a functional programmer, and he made this great talk in uh, at the ElmConf in 2016. And uh, the talk is really about what I'm talking about, which is constrain your data type to represent a more specific uh, thing about your model. So this is the exact thing that non-empty list represents. What he's talking about is the user um, in the application he's talking about has answered a list of questions. And what we want to do is let them move forward and backwards through the list of questions. So we have a current question is the one they're looking at right now. And we have a first and we have the others. So the reason he split it into first and others is he didn't want to have to accommodate in the code the idea of an empty empty history of questions. It's, it shouldn't be possible to finish the survey without answering the questions. So he's explicitly modeling the idea of non-emptiness. His quote is, if something is impossible, why should we represent it? So let's talk about how we would represent this in Scala. So Scala lets us implement interesting abstract data types and we can add the functionality that we want to. So what I'm going to do is drop into uh, Duct and um, here you can see this is uh, visual code. The structure of Duct is that it's divided into a core project that has all of the Duct type classes and data types and then there's an examples project where we can work on examples of specific um, things. So I'm going to create a, a new Scala file in there this is going to be uh, video 16, because that's what we're doing right now. And uh, we're just going to call it video 16. 
and it's going to be an application. So we'll just make it hello world for now so that it does something. Make sure that everything compiles correctly. Now you can see we can run it. And there we go, hello world. So that's a good start. The next thing we want to think about is what does the API look like for a non-empty list? Well, we want a non-empty list to specifically forbid um, creating lists that are empty. So that's one of the ideas of encapsulating the non-emptiness in a data in an abstract data type. So we're going to call um, the empty list. Uh, I'll just call it nil one. Is going to be a non-empty list of email addresses. So we would like that to be impossible. That should be an error. And if we supply one parameter, that should be okay. So I'm going to just going to put Justin at um, email dot com. So that should be fine. And then we can also make we can make the same thing with um, multiple email addresses. That would be just in one. So all of those things should be valid. Like at the moment we have a compile error because nothing we don't have non-empty lists. So let's fix that. We'll go to our data types folder. New Scala file empty file non empty list so we're going to implement non empty list as a case class and non empty list is a container or a collection so it has a thing that it contains and we're going to parameterize that as type a because we want to make non empty lists of any type and then we're going to represent the first element just like um, richard did in his presentation we're going to represent the first element as a concrete type A. So, so far what we've got is a compiler. Oh, I didn't give it a name. All right, so now we have non-empty lists that can only contain one thing, which is not where we want to be, but it's a good start. And this one, we should be able to import this now. There we go. So that is now the only error. Missing argument for parameter. Um, now the reason that's not compiling is because this has to contain things of type A but we didn't tell it what kind of things there are. So we can just explicitly say I want this to be a non-empty list of type a string. It has to be an explicit type. And then you can see that we have an error because um, we cannot create empty lists uh, with nothing in them. And that's perfect. That's what we wanted. Um, so now these are all working, which is uh, a little bit strange. Let's just run that and see if it's really working. Um, yeah, so this is working, but the problem is that the input here has been automatically turned into a tuple. So instead of this being three individual elements, it's just created a non-empty list with a tuple of things. So if we were to explicitly say we want a non-empty list of string, the answer is no. So you have to be careful of that automatic conversion to tuple, which we got bitten by there. So let's go back to the implementation. Uh, what we would like is to be able to have a rest of elements, and that's going to be using the variable argument list. So whatever A is, we can also have a sequence of A's. That's how Scala implements variable argument lists as a, a sequence. So yeah, if you look at the type there, it's a sequence of A, and this can be zero or more A's. Uh, so what that means now is that our non-empty list can now be constructed with one item, um, multiple items, but not zero items. Uh, so that's a good start. The next thing we want is to implement some useful operations for it. So later on I'm going to create a semi-group instance for this. Um, and for semi-group we need a way to be able to append non-empty lists together. So to do that, I'm going to make an append function. And this takes another list, another non-empty list of type A. Um, and this is going to return a new non-empty list of type A. And the implementation here is going to create a new non-empty list where the first parameter 
the the head of the new non-empty list is the is the head of the current uh, non-empty list. So this would just be first. Um, so the next thing we want to do is say that the uh, the rest of the elements is going to look like this. It's going to look like the rest of the elements on the left. Uh, and then we're going to take the the head of the other list or the first element in the other list, and then we want to append to that the rest of the elements of the other list. Um, and this is the wrong type because we were expecting um, this is a sequence of A, but what we want to do is splice these as individual elements into this um, into this variable argument list just as if we were calling it ourselves. Uh, so to do that we need to use some odd syntax like this. And what that does is say take this sequence and splice it in as a function call with variable arguments. Um, so that's essentially our append function. So we can just go we can just go back to our uh, test program and test it out. So let's call this just in one. And then what I want to do is print is append nil2 and uh, nil3. And that would look like this nil2 and nil3. Now we can run that. And there you go. We have a new non empty list uh, that begins, or well, the first element is the first element of the first list. And then we have the remaining elements in the rest there. Uh, so we already have like a working implementation of non-empty list, but it doesn't do much apart from you can append to it. Um, what would be nice is if we can convert it to a to a list, um, and then if you can convert it to a list, then anything you can do with a list you can do to this. So we'll just give it a to list function, and. Uh, this is going to return a list of A. So non-empty list always returns a list. That means this is a total function. So remember, total function is one that returns a value for every input. And it doesn't return any errors, and it doesn't return any missing values or anything like that. It always returns the thing that it says it would. So if you call to list on a non-empty list, we can guarantee that we, we return you a list. And that list looks like this. Uh, it just looks like first appended to rest and I believe that we uh, this is a sequence so we need to call to list and that would be the Scala to list on it uh, so let's just ch check that um, first of all I'm going to take this thing that I created call it appended and then what I want to do is uh, print them as a list. So we'll call appended to list. And because I insisted on it having um, parentheses, we have to add those. And there you go. We can convert to a list. The other thing we might want to do is, as a, as a service to our users, we might want to allow them to take any sequence and turn it into a non-empty list. So we'll add that as a companion object function. Um, so object non-empty list is going to have a function called uh, from sequence, which is going to take any sequence. We also need a type parameter for this. So any sequence of A, and it's going to return a non-empty list of A. Um, so what does that look like? Uh, well, we can create a new non-empty list, and what that involves is taking the head of the sequence and the rest of the sequence. Sorry, the tail of the sequence. And remember, we need to use the special syntax to splice that in as a parameter list. Okay, so that's the basic implementation from seek, so let's try it out. Um, what I want to do is take a list of emails and then we'll, we'll print uh, the list of emails as a non-empty list. So from seek L1 
Now if I run that, you'll see that we can now create non-empty lists from sequences. Now there's a big problem here. Uh, remember I just I was just talking about totality and uh, total versus partial functions. So we've let a uh, partial function sneak in here. And the reason we've done the the uh, mechanism by which that sneaked through is that we used head. Now um, head actually throws an exception. So it throws an exception if the list is empty, which means that our code is now not pure. It now has the side effect of throwing exceptions. Uh, so we need to fix this. And um, the way to fix it, um, let's just make this clear with an example. So let's have an empty list. We'll just, um, I need to specify the type because it will be empty. And uh, the list of strings, and it will be just like this. Oh. All right, so we could also, um, just uh, to make this more idiomatic, we, we can also do list empty and specify the type string. That's another way to do it. And um, let's print that out, and then we should see things blow up. So this would be E1, or EL for empty list. There we go. So we have an exception. So what's the solution here? Uh, our, our types are a contract, and the types tell the user of the API what we're allowed to do. And what that means is, non -em we cannot create non-empty things from empty things. So this type signature shouldn't be guaranteeing to return a non-empty list. What it should do is say, you know, maybe it's not a non-empty list, so we have to return an option. So we've been forced to change the API to make the, the code correct. And then what we can do is just say, uh, if the sequence is empty, then we can return none, otherwise we can return some. So this would be a uh, case first rest <laughs> sorry i'm still learning uh windows 11 for um interesting reasons i am making this video on windows and i just recently upgraded to windows 11. Uh, so we're going to create a non-empty list with the that begins with first and it ends with rest and then if we get an empty list which looks like that then we should return none. Uh, this should be sum. And now if we go back to our program, we can run this. And now you can see that we got none. So what this does is it surfaces to our API that if you do something to a non-empty list, um, or you try and create a non-empty list that's not empty, then you're going to have to handle it. You're going to have to do something different. So for example, in a normal list, you can just drop the you can just drop a number of elements, and it will return a num it will return an empty list if there was nothing to drop. But if you drop elements from a non-empty list, at some point you run out of things to drop, then you have to return none. So the whole API has to accommodate this extra constraint. The next section is about semigroups and monoid. I do have a video about monoids and semigroups, and I'll put a link in the uh, description about that. But uh, essentially, all we need to know is that a semigroup is a, is a type class that gives you the capability to append things together. So you can see the um, Scala 3 implementation of semigroup is a trait with an extension method uh, called combine. So you can take anything that has a semigroup instance and you can combine it with a thing of the same type. And combine just means append. So you can append strings together, for example. You can append lists together. And there are implementations of semigroup for both of those use cases. Now, um, there's no reason why we can't take advantage of our um, the fact that we already have an append function for non-empty list, which means that we can implement a semigroup for non-empty list. And then anything that uses semigroup, anything that requires a semigroup, automatically we'll get a non-empty list implementation for free. So what we do is we create a, a given. So this is an implicit 
uh, implementation that the Scala compiler will be able to find as long as we import it that will enable us to use non-empty lists as monoids, uh, semi-groups. <clears throat> so we're going to call it uh, non-empty list uh, semi-group and it will have inner type A. Just to explain that a bit, you can see the implementation of string semi-group does not have a type parameter um, because this just lets you append strings together. We can also append integers together in different ways and so on. But if it's an actual container, then we need to specify the type parameter of the thing inside the container. So we're creating a, an implicit for non-empty list semi-group. What that looks like is a semi-group of non-empty list uh, of type A. And this will have an extension method to implement combine. So we give it um, the left parameter. Sorry, the left parameter is this thing. So this would be a non-empty list of A. So this is an extension method on that type. And then we're implementing the combine method, which takes a right non-empty list, also of type A. And this would just use our append function. Um, so far, so good. So now, this appended um, code can use semigroup notation. Now, the reason we did this is not really just to get the semigroup notation, um, although that's nice. Um, the reason is, wherever we can use a semigroup, we can now use a non-empty list. Now, remember that I said we have to import the semigroup. So let's do that. Uh, let's just see if it can do it. Oh, it can't do it automatically, so we have to do it ourselves. So import. Da, da, da. Da, da, da. We're going to import the semigroup, and we're going to import its given instances. That means import all of the implicit things you've got. And there we go. Now we can use that. Um, I missed a dot. Then we can run. And everything works fine. Um, now I will talk later probably about things you can do with semi-groups that you can't do with monoids. Um, but the interesting thing here is that if we were to go back to our type classes, go to the monoid type class, um, you can see that um, monoid has is is um, a monoid is a semi-group but it also has a zero operation. So um, if you haven't watched the other video yet, you can go back and watch it. But the brief version is that a zero value is something that you can append to uh, some, some other element of the monoid. So let's say the monoid is integers. Um, you have a one and a two, and you want to combine them. Then you can combine the one and the two, and it will give you three. And that, that would be uh, an integer monoid implemented with addition. Um, now, what's the zero value? The zero value with integers is literally zero. So if you take one and zero, or zero and one, and add them together, you always get the original number. So you can add zero to anything, and it doesn't change it. That makes it good for a sort of default value. So if you have a list of things, and you want to do an operation on them, but you don't have anything in the list, you can use the zero value. Um, now, if something doesn't have a monoid instance, um, then you can't do that kind of thing. You can't fold on a list uh, with a default value because there's no monoid implementation. So if the zero value for integers is zero, the zero value for, let's say, lists is an empty list. So I can take a, a list of anything and I can append a, an empty list to it, uh, and that doesn't change the original list. So you can already start to see the problem that you can't implement a zero value for non-empty list because there's no empty version of non-empty list. Right. Um, another way we can prove that there's no zero value for non-empty lists is this. Um, we know that both non-empty lists contain at least one value, even if they're only one element long each. And if we append those two things together, we always double the length of the original list. So there's, there's really no way to create the zero value. So 
what we've gotten for free is this information that wherever you need a monoid, you can't use an unempty list. And you'll find that when you're um, modeling data using different types like non-empty list, you go to use it in a particular context and the compiler will say, no, you can't use it here because I need a monoid. And that kind of information is kind of interesting because it's coming um, just from the properties of the, the type. So the last thing I want to talk about is non-empty list in the wild. Um, so there's two functional programming libraries, Scala Z and CATS, that implement non-empty lists. And um, Zio Prelude, which is also um, a functional programming library, but it doesn't use category theory concepts, or at least they're not they're not surfaced they're not at the they're not surfaced to the user. Um, so what I want you to do is just have a quick look at how they implemented non-empty list, and point out a few interesting things about them. So first, here is non-empty list from cats. Sorry, when I said cats, my dog uh, was disturbed. So this is the documentation. Um, cats has really nice documentation. Um, the first thing they talk about is the motivation for non-empty lists, which is that they're really good for representing errors. So the validated type represents things that succeeded or maybe there was an error. And if there was an error, they can actually accumulate all the errors that happen. And because you would never have an error state, which doesn't have an error, then non-empty list is a good way to represent those errors. The interface for uh, non-empty list um, it doesn't use the trick I used, which was just this um, head and variable argument list notation. Instead, they split it up into different constructors. So you can call the one constructor to create a collection with only one thing, or you can call of to create it explicitly with a head and a tail of things. And of also looks like my constructor. Uh, so they make it explicit whether you're creating one thing or a list of things. So going back to the monoid and semigroup thing, um, they have quite a nice description in um, the documentation for reducible. Uh, so foldable and reducible are different things um, that depend on whether you have a monoid or a semigroup. So as they say here, because reducible does not require an empty value, the equivalent of fold and fold map, reduce and reduce map do not require an instance of monoid but of semigroup. Uh, so it's giving you a little bit more freedom. In Zaya Prelude, non-empty list has a couple of interesting properties. Um, so it's implemented as a um, combination of a single instance and a cons. So a cons is the um, cons is a element of a linked list that consists of the the head of the list and the rest of the list. So you can represent non-empty list in in um, using this data type, and this maps pretty closely to the way that Scala represents lists, where lists consist of a cons cell and a, and a empty cell called nil. And if you look at the Zero Prelude source code, they have an implicit conversion called to cons that will take a non-empty list and turn it into a list cons cell. So what that means is you can more easily interoperate with lists without having to think about it much. Finally, we look at Scala Z. So Scala Z again represents a non-empty list as a trait. Um, this is kind of unfashionable now, but they use symbolic names for different operations. Um, you can see that map and flat map is built into the type, and um, you can see that it has some constructors here and it uses the same, this nil constructor uses the same trick, except it converts the tail to list, uh, whereas I just leave it as a sequence. So one thing that's interesting about Scala Z is I was thinking about, is it possible to represent um, non-empty collections or make a wrapper that can wrap any type of collection and make it a non-empty one? And uh, this is somewhat of an attempt to do that. So it gives you a head and a tail uh, you can see that it takes a uh, type F, um, and the reason for that is that you can use the type bounds of F to determine what capabilities there are of the tail. Um, so this is pretty complex, um, pretty complicated to use, but um, I think it uh, is an interesting question of whether we can build a generic non-MT collection. 
non-empty lists more or less. Um, so that's kind of a pun because, you know, more or less means I'm basically going to cover the non-empty list, show you how to implement it, but not all of the functions, all of the methods. Uh, but it also means more or less in terms of is non-empty list worth the trouble or not? So let's take a look at, um, <clears throat> let's take a look at the pros and cons of using something like a non-empty list. Uh, so unfamiliarity can be considered uh, a con. Um, so you have to explain what this data type is for to um, a user that may not be familiar with it. And um, you always need to be careful when you introduce a new concept or a new data type that uh, your whole team is on board with it and they're not going to be tripped up by this new type, get confused. Um, so it's really about gradually bringing your whole team together to decide what is too much when it comes to uh, adding new things. It might introduce complexity with serialization. So depending on the serialization code that you use, if you have to write this to a database or something, uh, you might need to write some special serialization code. Uh, it really depends what your situation is. And uh, finally, lists are more powerful. So you're choosing less power. You're choosing a data structure that can represent less things. And you can see that as a negative or you can see it as a positive. But I listed it with the negatives because, um, you know, in general, we just reach for the most powerful tool. And uh, once you restrict yourself, you feel like you're getting less. Uh, so even though that's on the negative list, I think it's actually a positive as we'll see on the next one. So what's more about non-empty lists? Uh, it communicates more semantic meaning. So both the Scala compiler and people using your code understand that the data structure uh, marked with non-empty lists cannot be empty. So it th they know just looking at it that this is something that can never be empty and they don't have to worry about handling the case where it's not. The principle of least power um, basically says that you should always use the least powerful mechanisms in your, uh, in your arsenal. Um, and the reason is that least powerful things tend to be easier to reason about and compose so if you take the most extreme example, you have a whole programming language at your disposal, say Python or Go, these are imperative languages, very few restrictions, you can do whatever you want, and you can create code that's difficult to compose the pieces together and difficult to reason about. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got Haskell, which is um, restricted in a lot of ways, and um, what it means is you can much more easily compose and reason about the code because you know all of the restrictions and rules and laws that it's adhering to. And so that's really my last point. It's easier to reason about and compose um, the least powerful things that you use. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is uh, this quote from E.W. Dijkstra. Uh, so Dijkstra, um, uh, I must say I got this quote from uh, Runar Bjornsson's talk at uh, uh, I think Scala World a few years ago, it was called uh, Constraints Liberate, Liberties Constrain. Uh, very similar to the points I've been making. And uh, this quote, being abstract is something profoundly different from being vague. The purpose of abstraction is not to be vague, but to create a new semantic level in which one can be absolutely precise. So in other words, don't think of data types and abstractions as uh, making your code more generic, more vague. Uh, what you're really doing is telling the compiler, telling your users exactly what you want to do. So thanks for watching. I'm so glad you made it all the way to the end of the video. Uh, if you're not subscribed, then please subscribe. Smash the like button and uh, tell your friends to watch the amazing Functional Justin episodes. Okay, thanks a lot. Until next time. Bye.